Welcome to Capture Paranormal. We're out here at the Baldoon Settlement just outside of Wallsburg, Ontario. And we are here today to talk about the Baldoon mystery. Uh, we're here with Dawn Mudford, who is a local historian and she has a wealth of knowledge on the events surrounding the Baldoon mystery. So why don't you uh, just tell us what you know about, like, the, the John McDonald side, and then maybe you can kind of tell you us. I just about want to that. hear my, my my rendition of. Yeah, I can do my my little my little story of the Baldoon mystery, which yep. the beginnings of this happened um, over in Scotland, actually. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the Highland Clearances, and there was a lot of people being displaced from their homes over in Scotland in the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. So um, during this time, there was a, a lord. His name was uh, Thomas Douglas, Lord Selkirk. And um, he was kind of a benevolent fellow, and he really felt for the people of the Highlands. They had no jobs, they had nowhere to go, their families were starving. So he did some exploration over in the New World. So he um, came to this area here, actually, and it was down, um, maybe four or five kilometers down, down this way in Dover Township. And he found some land down there along the Sny, which this is the Sny. Um, it's also known as the Chanelli Cart, and back then it was called the Chanelli Cart. The Baldoon Farm was right. If you Google it, there is a point in the river when you get to the Sydenham East Branch and the Sny. So the Sydenham East Branch comes out of Wallaceburg, and they meet, and there's a point of land, and it's 800 acres, and that was the Baldoon Farm. So they were actually across the river from it, so they must have had to canoe over to work the farm because mm -hmm. their, their their land was across the river and when they got here there was a big problem see he had sent over a few guys to um, build them housing to get the farm going so when they got here they were supposed to be completely set up with places to live you know and the farm ready and september they would have been ready for the harvest well there was a problem when they got here nothing was done there was nothing for them nothing um he sent over these three guys and seven barrels of whiskey there wasn't a drop of whiskey left one of the guys died from alcohol poisoning mm. and all he did was drink they did nothing so they came here thinking that everything was going to be wonderful and it was it was anything but so they had no they had nothing so they made the best of it they had some uh, ship sails that they found and they made tents out of them they were very very creative people um, times were extremely difficult for them with winter coming and they don't you know when they're from Scotland they don't know anything about a Canadian winter mm. so they actually met up with some of the natives from Opal Island who were believe it or not quite helpful to them and in even in, in some of the um, research that I've done they've even said that if it wasn't for the natives they would never have survived so you know we should be very thankful actually for that and they helped them out and um, then, then uh, you know, they were, they were struggling along, and um, then along comes this war. The War of 1812 to 1814 comes along, and the Kentucky Raiders came through here, and they raided the farm, stole all the sheep that they were supposed to be making money from. They had the finest Merino sheep, and they stole them all, took them to New York. And uh, it, was, it was quite a time. They, you know, did a lot of killing and stealing and, and destroyed everything. Well... The Baldwin people had had quite enough crap, <laughs> and 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 there was he'd, and he'd also hired this guy to manage the farm. His name was um, Al Alexander McDonald, and he didn't want to be here. He didn't want that job. He hated the people. He sent letters letters back saying they were stupid, they were illiterate. He was giving them a hard time, and they said enough. They rebelled. They packed up what little they had, and they moved here to higher ground. So they settled right here in this area, right where we are. Um, um, one of the families was um, the McDonald family and at the time when they came over John McDonald was about five years old five six years old and so by the time they moved up here it was the 1820s 
and so he was a, a grown a grown up then. Um, and but they they built their housing up in here and they farmed up here. They just squatted the land here. And um, they, but they started doing quite well. So getting into a little farther down and them am doing okay. John John has got himself situated. He's married. He's got a couple of kids. Doing very successful as a fisherman and as a farmer. Doing real well. He gets approached by this by this woman. And she's not referred to by any name in Neil MacDonald's book. And and as I said earlier, Neil MacDonald would have been one of John MacDonald's son. And he wrote the compilation and the story of the Baldu mystery. And it was a compilation of 26 affidavits from people who swear that they were witnesses to the events that happened. Um, so this is the point where things start getting a little bit sketchy. And... This is where things changed. It was... <clears throat> um, so there was this lady who lived, they called her the Swamp Witch. And she lived with her two brutish sons. She was a widow. Um, she was also a, a, a settler. She came over on the ship. And um, she, she heard about him buying this piece of property. There was a piece of property that was going up for sale. And uh, she wanted it for her sons. And he was buying the, the property or he bought the property and she wanted it and she said to him you need to sell me that piece of land I want that property and he goes no sorry uh, it, you know it's mine I've got it mm -hmm. she said no I want that land he goes lady don't you hear me get lost you know I bought it she said to him John McDonald you will rue the day that you messed with me he laughed he laughed at her called her a crazy old lady go back to your swamp so John goes about farming his land and suddenly all these things start happening to him of course he's not knowing why these things are happening to him but he went to plant crops on that land and the corn he planted corn and the corn would grow up to a foot tall and turn brown and die nothing would grow on that land nothing um, if one of his chickens laid an egg they would die so he was losing his livestock. His oxen that he used to plow the fields with dropped dead right in their harnesses in the field. And there was strange things going on in his house. If his wife would walk through, through the house, she would hear footsteps behind her and she'd turn around quickly and there would be nobody there. Things started shaking and rattling in the house. The, the implements on the mantle would bang and clatter and, 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 and just make all kinds of noise. One day, the tea kettle picked itself up and poured itself out. It just went up into the air and dumped its contents onto the floor. Fires would break out all over the house. Now at this point, John had several children and he had a baby. And in my research, what isn't mentioned in the book is that he had a niece who was about 15 years old who was living with him and her name was Jane. Well, one day, um, there were investigators that came because this stuff that was going on there started getting out. The house would rattle and rock and roll and the bed would shake and rock and roll and come up off. The house would come right off of its foundation. It would just, it was crazy. So one day there was some investigators came to check it out and the, um, the baby's there laying in its cradle. And all of a sudden this child started screaming blue bloody murder. And the, and the mother's going, what, what, what's going on here? Well, she picked up the baby and there was a stone underneath of the baby's back that was boiling hot. But they didn't know how it got there. So they picked it up and they took it and they threw it into the snow. And it, the, it sizzled. It sizzled as it dropped. And then they went back and they went, well, that's strange. They go back into the house and the stone was laying there all soaking wet. And the very, very, very first incident that had gone on that I kind of skipped by was the, the um, family, the girls were out weaving straw in the barn. So they, they used straw, they weaved hats. So they were weaving and all of a sudden a, a barn beam fell down amongst them. And they went scared to death, what's going on here? And then they decided, well, that's just a freak incident. I don't you know what. And so they went back to weaving and next thing you know, two more beams fell. Of course, they go running into the house screaming. 
scared to death and the men are all in there going stop what don't talk all at once what's what's going on and they told them and they said and then suddenly a bullet came through the window and dropped on the floor and they thought oh my god that must be a stray hunter a stupid guy you should be care you know more more uh, a stray bullet from a careless hunter mm -hmm. be more careful and they're looking around next thing you know several bullets come through the windows and then when the bullets came through they didn't smash the windows like you'd think they just pierced a hole a hole would go through and they would drop on the floor no one would ever get hit with them so it was like they were thrown by hand rather than shot from a gun is what the stories say right uh, yeah more or less i yeah. guess you can you can assume that you can assume anything i guess <laughs> But so they picked up the bullets and they thought, well, they're going to get rid of them. And they brought them out and they threw them into the snow. So next thing you know, all those wet bullets back in the house, laying around. And then the ante got upped, upped a little bit. When the bullets stopped coming, stones did. And there would be rocks would come through the windows. And they would mark the rocks and throw them back in the river. And the same stones would come through with the marks on them. So there was a lot of strange things. And eventually, of course, the rocks aren't going to pierce a little hole. Eventually, he had no windows left. All the glass was shattered. He had, he had no windows. An, a, another incident, um, there was a, a gentleman from Sombra up here. And um, he was a school teacher. His name was Robert Barker. Now, Robert Barker had this sort of secret thing that he did. He was a witch hunter. And he came to Mr. McDonald and he said to him, look, I can help you, you know, just don't tell anybody. And um, we, can, we can try to get rid of whatever is, you know, whatever is haunting you. So he um, put signs all over the house and he went all over and he did incantations and saging and, and, and he put signs, which be gone and, and stuff over the door. Well, things just got worse after that. It was shortly thereafter that Mr. Barker was arrested. And he was arrested for practicing witchcraft, which was illegal in Canada. Mm -hmm. And he, it is actually on record, he is the only person in Canada to have ever been arrested and convicted of practicing witchcraft. Really? So they arrested him, they put him in shackles, and they took him in canoe down to Sandwich, which is Windsor area. And he was put in jail. Now, six months later, he, he was just a ruined man. He weighed next to nothing. He'd lost a lot of weight. He looked terrible. He aged many, many years. And he appealed it. And so the judge says to him, well, Mr. Barker, you, did you take any money for doing this? He said, well, no. So the judge said, well, I guess because you didn't take any money, you've really done nothing wrong. But don't do it again, you're free to go. Mr. Barker's life was ruined. Uh, he ended up going to the state side and was never heard from again in this area. Then there was the um, constable who came from Corona. Because word was getting around about this a lot. People were coming from New York State and they were coming to gather the witch balls because the witch balls were coming, these would be the, the lead bullets, the lead mm -hmm. balls. They were coming, they were selling them. They were collecting them and they were selling these witch balls. From, from all over the place. This was like a big deal. Nobody knew what was going on. Anyways, uh, the, um, the guy comes from Corona and um, he, he says something to him, you know, about, you know, things going on here and, you know, what, you know, what are you doing? This is, you know, this can't be true. I don't believe in any of this stuff. He was a skeptic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Looking at me. And before, and before long, a rock came through the window, a big one, and hit him right in the chest and knocked him right over. Then the gun that was sitting in the corner started dancing on its own in the middle of the room and shooting bullets into the ceiling, which of course was like a thatch type thing and putting holes in the roof. Yep. So he just sort of went out of there shaking his head going, um, I didn't see anything here. I'm, and he was gone. Um, there was another fellow who was a regular visitor to the farm. His name was Patrick Tobin and he was a peddler. But Patrick goes, you know, I, I, I like coming here. I like you people. I, I don't understand what's going on here. It's really scary. He says, and I don't want to accuse anybody of anything. He said, but I had a pouch and it contained 25 pieces of silver and they're all missing. And uh, John McDonald says, oh, no fear, Mr. Tobin. He says, they'll appear. Within five minutes, 
pieces of silver started dropping out of the ceiling and landing on his plate. One, two, three. And he got to 24. Patrick gathered them up. and He says, tell the children to keep the other one. I'm out of here. And he never returned. <laughs> he said, that's enough of that. Eventually, he couldn't keep up with his fires. The fires and his house burnt to the ground. Yeah. So he thought, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to go live in a tent. <laughs> So they set up their tents and they took what little bit of stuff that they had and they set up their tents. But you know, a tent isn't anything against this cold Canadian climate. And I imagine it was probably a lot colder then and probably got a lot more snow then too. And uh, eventually they had to go and uh, live with his dad. They take the children to go live in his dad's house. And he thought, well, you know, it's over now. The house is haunted, mm -hmm. you know, it's over. Think, you know, what he didn't realize is that his house wasn't haunted at all, he was. And all the same stuff started happening in his father's house. Um, the one day they went to, um, to church on the Sunday and they came back from church and all of the furniture in the house was stacked in the middle of the room. And there was a Bible open laying there and no one had any explanation of that. Then one day the, um, this man came to the house and um, he was a minister of the Methodist Church, and his name was Reverend McDormand. And he said to John, um, I, this is not of my faith or belief, but I think I may have heard of someone that can help you with what's going on here. He says, clearly you're a broken man and you need help. So he said, there is a young girl she was supposed she had the ability to she was a soothsayer she had the ability to see things in a stone and would be able to maybe help him and tell him who who was causing him all the trouble what was going on prior to him leaving about a month before he left and I don't know why he didn't kind of get it the old woman came to his house and said mr. McDonald uh, I need you to weave me a rug and he said well no don't you know what's going on here I've got all these awful things going on. I can't possibly take on any work. And she said, Mr. McDonald, you'll have no problems when you're in my employ. So for two weeks while he was weaving the rug, everything was quiet. He thought, oh, good. And the minute that he delivered the rug to her, everything started back up again. So he was ready to just pack it in. And when he heard from this McDormand guy, he said, that's it. So him and his father, and Reverend McDormand rode on horseback for three days to the Long Point, Port Rowan area. And they found this Dr. Troyer, T-R-O-Y-E-R, -E John Troyer. And John Troyer was apparently himself a witch hunter. And he had in his room something called a witch trap. And that witch trap is in the Port Rowan Museum. Now, Dr. Troyer was a well-respected man in this community, even though he was a witch hunter, and claimed that the witches would come and get him at night and he'd fly around with them and they'd have their way with them. But he was out in the field one day and he found um, a moonstone and he gave it to his daughter. And his daughter apparently had this gift of second sight or whatever, and she could read into this stone. So they go there to see her and they get there and she refuses to see them. And they begged her, you know, we've ridden, we've, this, this, is, this is awful, like, you have no idea. And the girl was really kind of a strange, trancey, sort of weird girl. Eventually, they convinced her that they were desperate enough that they needed her help. So she sits there and she looks at him and she looks into the stone and she goes, Mr. McDonald, have you had trouble with a piece of land? Do you know this woman? And then she goes on to describe this person who always dressed in black, she was a widow, lived in that long, low house down the road, by in the swamp, described her sons, went on to, oh yes, yes, I know her very well. He goes, uh, Mr. McDonald, you've had a lot of problems with fires. He said, she says, check your time right now. Your barn is burning right now. Your barn is burning to the ground. She says to him, what you need to do is you need to go home and you need to make a bullet. She said, have you, no, first of all, she said, have you seen a strange bird in your flock? He said, actually, yes, there's this black goose. It doesn't belong to me. I've, I have no idea where it came from. And it's just weird. And she goes, uh, he goes, um, I, I've tried to shoot it. She said, well, what have you tried to shoot it with? 
He says, well, bullet, lead bullets, of course. Oh, no bullet of lead will harm a feather on that bird. You need to go home and you need to make a bullet out of silver and you need to shoot the bird, but don't kill it, just wound it. And when you wound it, you will find that your enemy has a corresponding injury. So he goes, they ride back home and he gets home and he sees his barn still smoldering. And he starts laughing and carrying on, oh my God, thank goodness. And everybody thinks he's lost his mind because he's celebrating the barn being burned down. Because now he's thinking, well, maybe there is something to this, you know, like, mm. you know, maybe there's something to this story. So he gets the lead bullet, and he, or the silver bullet, and he invites everybody to come down to the swamp, down to the pond there where, where the uh, black goose was flooding around, floating around. Saw it, took aim, shot it in the wing, and the thing made the most ungodly sound, like he'd never heard before. Human, animal, screech, squeal, never heard anything like it. So he then dropped the gun and then went for a walk down the road to the swamp to where the long low house was. And there was the old widow. She was sitting on her front porch rocking with her arm in a sling. Interestingly, the same arm as the wing that he had shot. And she cussed and cursed and scowled at him. And following that, there were no more incidents at Baldoon. And that is the Baldoon mystery. All right, so thank you very much, Don, for your wealth of knowledge and uh, helping us explore this part of paranormal history.